What's going on guys? So in today's video, we'll be looking at the sequence of events that have led to Carmelo Anthony's release from the Houston Rockets, which was most likely his last and final stop in the NBA. As many of you already know, Carmelo Anthony came into the league in 2003 after being drafted by the Denver Nuggets and was a part of the legendary NBA draft which featured LeBron James, Dwayne Wade, and Chris Bosh. As a rookie, Carmelo Anthony had a stellar season helping lead the Denver Nuggets into the playoffs for the first time since the 1994-1995 season while also making a great case for himself as the NBA's Rookie of the Year. And although that first season was considered a success in the eyes of many for the Denver Nuggets, what quickly became apparent was the tension between Carmelo Anthony and then head coach Jeff Fazdillic. During a stretch early in his rookie season, Carmelo Anthony saw a reduction in his playing time which led to a private meeting with head coach Jeff Fazdillic who then made it known why he had limited Anthony's minutes and why he was asking him to do more. And when addressing the media about this meeting, Jeff Bezdelic said that he had backed it up with the videotape, saying that it was very revealing and that the tape doesn't lie. He would also add that he specifically told Carmelo Anthony that his job wasn't to be his friend or to be liked, but to simply turn him into a good basketball player. Now unfortunately, this wouldn't be the only time that Carmelo Anthony clashed with Jeff Bezdelic, as it would later be reported by the Denver Post that Jeff Bezdilic had once tried to suspend Carmelo Anthony later that season for refusing to re-enter a game, but was only unsuccessful as the front office did not back him. Then in the first round of the 2004 playoffs against the Minnesota Timberwolves, it was Jeff Bezdilic who after game 4 criticized Carmelo Anthony for not doing a good enough job of moving without the basketball. But while none of these incidents stopped the Denver Nuggets from having a relatively successful season, it did plant a seed that carried over the following season. After a disappointing 13 and 15 start to the 2004-2005 season, Jeff Bezdilic was fired as head coach of the Denver Nuggets. And while Nene, who was on the Denver Nuggets, cited the players tuning him out as something that had become a problem, it was also reported that Carmelo Anthony may have been at the root of Bezdilic falling out of favor with the players and his firing, especially since there had been reported tension between the two in a game against the Cleveland Cavaliers on December 2nd. Shortly after Bezdilic's firing during the 2004-2005 season, George Carl was named as the new head coach of the Denver Nuggets. And over the next five and a half seasons under George Carl, the Denver Nuggets were not only one of the most exciting teams in the league to watch, but they were also able to win 54 games during the 2008-2009 season, which was the most for the franchise since 1988. They were also able to reach the Western Conference Finals that season, where they would unfortunately lose to the Lakers in six games. And although Carmelo Anthony and George Carl's time together is seen as somewhat successful, considering what they were able to accomplish in those five and a half seasons, it did come with its fair share of battles. Like in March of 2009, when Carmelo Anthony was given a team suspension for refusing to come out of the game and go to the bench during a regular season game. And while there weren't many other reported incidents between the two in Denver, in his book that was published in 2017, George Carl was very open about his time with Carmelo Anthony in Denver in which he said, Carmelo Anthony was a true conundrum for me in the six years I had him. He was the best offensive player I ever coached. He was also a user of people, addicted to the spotlight, and very unhappy when he had to share it. He really lit my fuse with his low demand of himself on defense. He had no commitment to the hard, dirty work of stopping the other guy. My idea, probably every coach's idea, is when your best player is also your leader. But since Carmelo Anthony only played hard on one side of the ball, he made it plain he couldn't lead the Nuggets, even though he said he wanted to. Coaching him meant working around his defense and compensating for his attitude. Now while many have proclaimed that George Carl might have only said this in order to sell his book, it must be taken into account that George Carl had been uttering these very words 
many years prior to the book even being published. Defense is commitment. I got young guys. They're going to, and I got guys, if they don't give me the commitment, I got someone who's going to give a commitment today. So again, the system sometimes ties you up from getting the commitment. You just got to handle what Melo gives you. You got to manage what Melo gives you. It's different now. Uh, you know, we, and, and I, I think, you know, I'm not knocking Melo's. Melo's a great offensive player, the best offensive player I've ever coached. But his defensive focus, his demand of himself, is what frustrated us more than anything. After five and a half seasons with George Carl as his head coach, Carmelo Anthony was then traded upon request from the Denver Nuggets to the New York Knicks. Now unfortunately for the New York Knicks, who were then coached by Mike D'Antoni and led by all NBA power forward Amari Stoudemire, the addition of Carmelo Anthony didn't do much in helping them win basketball games as they would only win 14 of their last 27 games with Carmelo Anthony in the lineup leading to a first round sweep at the hands of the Boston Celtics in the 2011 playoffs. After getting off to a shaky 9-15 start the following season, and with Carmelo Anthony out indefinitely after injuring his groin in a game against the Utah Jazz, Mike D'Antoni placed Jeremy Lin as the centerpiece of the Knicks offense. Give him those jump shots, just don't let him put it down on the floor. Lynn likes the open floor, spinning, puts it up and oh, backs it in. Yes. Sensational play for Jeremy Lynn. And, and he's the Garden enjoying Brown on its feet again. Mike, he's really enjoying it. You can see this. With the ball in his hands. Fans on their feet. Five, four, Lynn for the win. The strip for the Lynn throws it ahead to Tony Douglas. Up for the layup, backs it in. Now, oddly enough, that run came to an end once Carmelo Anthony returned and was unwilling to move over to the power forward position, which would better suit the style of play that the Knicks were now playing. And as Mike D'Antoni then confirmed in an exclusive piece on ESPN, Carmelo Anthony then gave an ultimatum to the New York Knicks front office between himself and Mike D'Antoni, which led to D'Antoni's resignation on March 14, 2012. Following D'Antoni's resignation, Mike Woodson was then promoted as head coach of the New York Knicks, and is perhaps the only coach still to this very day to never publicly criticize Carmelo Anthony. As the head coach, he would help the New York Knicks finish the season with an 18-6 record before losing to the Miami Heat in the first round of the playoffs in five games. However, during the offseason, the New York Knicks front office would add key veterans to the roster who would help the New York Knicks finish the 2012-2013 season with the second best record in the Eastern Conference, but would unfortunately lose to the Indiana Pacers in the second round of the playoffs. And over the next four years, the New York Knicks would not only have a losing record every season with Carmelo Anthony as the centerpiece of the offense, but would also fail to make the playoffs despite hiring three different coaches during that stretch. And while there were reports of one heated exchange between Carmelo Anthony and then head coach Jeff Hornacek, who was then backed by former head coach Kurt Rambis, who questioned Carmelo Anthony's effort on defense, perhaps the more outspoken critic of Carmelo Anthony in New York during that time was Phil Jackson, who as president of basketball operations had made the point in an interview that Carmelo Anthony had a tendency to hold the ball a bit too long. 
Then there was the infamous column by longtime friend of Phil Jackson, Charlie Rosen, who stated that Anthony had outlived his usefulness in New York. And after Bleacher Report's Kevin Ding wrote a column detailing Anthony and Jackson's relationship, Phil Jackson then responded on Twitter by suggesting that Anthony didn't have the desire to win, which eventually all came to a head at the end of the 2017 season when Phil Jackson boldly stated that Carmelo Anthony would be better off somewhere else giving the direction the Knicks were going in. After Carmelo Anthony's polarizing time with the New York Knicks, he then agreed to be traded to the Oklahoma City Thunder to play alongside Russell Westbrook and Paul George while being coached by Billy Donovan. That experiment was not only unsuccessful as Carmelo Anthony himself stated, but came to a head in the 2018 playoffs when Billy Donovan decided to bench Carmelo Anthony in the fourth quarter of games five and six against the Utah Jazz, much to Anthony's dismay. After that series, Carmelo Anthony proceeded to then express his displeasure about the possibility of coming off of the bench for the Thunder the following season, which eventually led to him being traded to the Houston Rockets during the summer, where after playing in only 11 regular season games, he was unofficially released by the team. Carmelo's not on the Kobe level, but only because of rings. I'll buy that. Only because okay. of rings. That's it. Ultimately, this falls on the shoulders of Mike D'Antoni. And I, Skip, I can't tell you how much I hate saying that because I, I, I genuinely like him. And, I know. And, and I want him to succeed because I don't want him to get fired. I really don't. But it's inevitable. If you're watching Carmelo Anthony, Skip, this dude is making a pass and he's cutting and he's literally calling for dudes to come set picks and move in certain areas. I mean, it's a shame that he has to literally direct people so much, but that's what he finds himself having to do. I think Porzingis is talented. I think he's got a future. I think he's got a chance. But to trade Carmelo Anthony, their best player, is asinine. This poll is a disgrace. It's an embarrassment. And as far as I'm concerned, the damn network should be ashamed for having the poll on. By putting 63 players ahead of Carmelo Anthony, you are saying that at least two players on every team is better than Carmelo Anthony, a career near 25 per point per game scorer, who's repeatedly a number one option, who's a scoring machine and one of the prolific scorers of the modern era. Oh, stop it. He's Carmelo Anthony. Not only has he been a starter, he's been a star for the vast majority of his career. There is no excuse on God's green earth for Carmelo Anthony to be coming off the bench for the Houston Rockets. Carmelo's not on the Kobe level, but only because of ring. I'll buy that. Only because okay. of rings. That's it. But perhaps what Carmelo Anthony's career has been able to display is the true power of the media who has acted as a proverbial shield for Anthony to any criticism thrown his way. Especially ESPN's very own Stephen A. Smith, who has not only failed to truly criticize Carmelo Anthony since arriving in New York, but has also made it a point on his daily talk show to lambaste anyone who has held Anthony accountable in any way, shape, or form. However, in looking back at Carmelo Anthony's career, the bit of criticism that he did receive was not only fair and spot on, but should have been taken much more seriously given the track record of the criticizers themselves. For example, Jeff Bezdilic, who had criticized Carmelo Anthony for not playing well without the basketball, had been named the NBA's best advanced scout by Sports Illustrated in 1997 and one of the NBA's top five assistants by USA Today in 2000. George Carl, who had criticized Carmelo Anthony's lack of focus on defense, had not only been successful in his time with the Sonics and the Milwaukee Bucks, but was also named the NBA's Coach of the Year the season after Carmelo Anthony was traded from Denver and is still only one of nine NBA coaches with over 1,000 career victories. Mike D'Antoni, 
who had criticized Carmelo Anthony's unwillingness to adjust his game by moving over to the power forward position, had been known for revolutionizing offenses in the NBA during the mid-2000s with the Phoenix Suns, where he was rightfully named coach of the year in 2005, and following a short stint with the Lakers after leaving the New York Knicks, had continued success with the Houston Rockets, where he was again named the NBA's coach of the year in 2017. Phil Jackson, who had criticized Carmelo Anthony for holding onto the ball for too long amongst other things, had not only won two NBA championships with the New York Knicks in the early 1970s as a player, but is also viewed as arguably the greatest coach in NBA history given his 11 championships. And Billy Donovan, who had planned for Carmelo Anthony to come off of the bench in his second season with the OKC Thunder, was a two-time NCAA champion with the Florida Gators. But in spite of this constructive criticism, all of which was well-deserved, excuses continue to be made for a player who since coming into the league has played with more talented point guards than any other player of his generation and has vastly underachieved considering his own talent. And when all of that is combined with the strong brotherhood that exists within NBA coaching circles, it seems as if Carmelo Anthony, at this point in his career, may simply be reaping what he has sown. Oh, stop it! He's Carmelo Anthony!